Ernesto, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, you bet. Thank you so much for having me. I think we're gonna have a great conversation. I can already tell we were talking before we started recording and we got a, we got a lot of stuff in common. I think we kind of think on the same wavelength and I think we're gonna talk about a lot of great things. I wanted to maybe start out with talking a little bit about you and, you and your story. You've got a ton of stuff going on and we're trained as a physician. And I know that was kind of the early days, but how do you get, how do you get to this point of being like a physician going down the normal channels to now being this entrepreneur and all sorts of different ventures? Tell me a little bit about your story and how you got where you are. Yeah, you bet. So I trained as a physician, a medical doctor. I specialized in age management medicine, trained in Mexico, then here in Europe, and also in the US at the Senegenics Medical Institute. I often tell people that when I got to Senegenics, I went there to train and further my training in age management medicine. But what I really learned and what stuck with me was medical marketing. These guys were top of the game. These were a bunch of marketers who just decided to start a healthcare business, not the other way around. And frankly, I fell in love with it. So when I finished that training, I, I always had that knowledge, but I came back and I started working at a stem cell clinic, which I after a little while, I ended up staying in charge of until it was sold. And what made the difference there was really, I mean, I always tell people I enjoyed being a clinician. I like to think I was good. At least that's what my patients used to tell me. But really what made the difference, because there's a lot of really good qualified clinicians out there, but we were like the premier stem cell destination when I was in charge. It was the number one destination for stem cell therapy for autism, for instance, and for a couple of other conditions. And the reason was not because I was so good or the team that we had put together was so good, which we were, but it was because we understood marketing and, and, and we understood how important it is to differentiate the um, clinical care from the running a business side of it. So it was, although I was doing both things, I was fortunate enough to get a mentor who taught me how to how to identify that I was wearing two different hats and recognize how each hat or how each persona was contributing to the growth of business and to give each side of it the weight that it deserved. And I think it was a, a great combo. And something funny started happening throughout those years. The people that I went to school with, because, and we were having this conversation before, a lot of the times doctors in Mexico, they are entrepreneurs, not bec because it's not common to be employed as it is in the US, these big practices, group practices, and these big hospital groups. It, it's just not common. So for your own office, you are an entrepreneur. And a lot of my friends, people that I went to school with, started asking me, how do you do this? How do you do this other thing? Can you help me out? And started helping them out and things started working out. And then they started telling their friends. And when people I didn't know started calling me for advice, I started charging for it. And, and, and before I realized, I, I had a consultancy on, on, on the side that was doing great. And my wife is from Spain. And because medical licenses aren't exactly portable, it got to a time where we said, you know what? I think we could just go spend some time over there in Europe, have your family near the kids, have them grow up, and I'll, I'll do this full time. And so that's, that's what I've been doing. I've been scaling up my, my role as a fractional CMO, because that's another thing that I noticed a lot of medical practices lack. A lot of the times, for me, it was a great transition, but I have to recognize that not a lot of doctors want to be marketers, but the few who understand the difference value the role of what a, what a fractional chief marketing officer can do, especially somebody who understands clinical care. And so that's what I've been doing a lot of I ended up starting a medical marketing agency called Practice Growth Formula, which is also keeps me occupied the rest of the time. But most importantly, one of the things that I really enjoy is, is being able, having that freedom. And it's what I what I work with my with my clients on and in and, and doing some lifestyle design, but it's having that freedom to, in my case, be time shifted. So for me, now I'm able to spend time with my kids in the morning. I take them to school. I wake up, I sleep in, I do all these things. And then later in the afternoon, that's when I start getting busy because that's when most of my clients in the US and Canada start waking up. And, and so making that choice is what, or making that distinction and, and, and just moving forward with it is what has been probably the most impactful in my life in, in a while. Sure, I'm not a clinician at the moment, but I'm enjoying the life that I've created. And so that's exactly what I want to help a lot of other physicians do. And for them, it might be different. Many people say like, oh my God, that's the worst idea of being time shifted and working up until 9, 10 p.m. Like, that's great. 
Let's figure out what's important to you and let's make it happen. If you want to continue seeing patients, let's figure out a way that we can do that, but still leave some time so that you can be with your family or or do the hobbies, do the things that you care about. And so that's what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Yeah, I was writing down things as you were saying. There's like 10 different things I'm super curious about and would love to talk about, but I know we don't have the time. And I think each one could be like a little sub podcast, like this whole entrepreneurship idea. I'd love it if we could kind of focus on that in our time today. Also, you said about important to you. Like, I think it ties in well with entrepreneurship and people miss that. They kind of think of that coming from maybe more money or more wealth or whatever. And I really believe that entrepreneurship, one of the best benefits of it is that it allows you this autonomy, flexibility, ability to kind of really lean into what's most important to you. I've had many conversations with physicians where they're like, I just don't have the space to do what's most important to me, basically, is what they're saying. And it's because they're like just enslaved almost into these monster controlling practices or systems, hospital systems or whatever. But entrepreneurship, I think, is really the way to go. And I know we agree on that, but you even said it, or in a different way, you had suggested or we had talked about before is that entrepreneurship is even maybe the solution to a lot of these healthcare crises we're dealing with. And so I would love it if we could kind of talk about that. Yeah, you bet. So I think it's really interesting that you've been doing this as well for a while. So it's it's obvious that you pick it up. When I talk to a lot of doctors about entrepreneurship, they immediately think it's about making more money, right? We have this idea that if you're an entrepreneur it's because you want to be filthy rich and you don't care about whether people say, well, whenever I tweet something along those lines of entrepreneurship, we need more entrepreneurial physicians. There's always the people that come out and say like, that's the worst idea you could ever have. Doctors are already super greedy and blah, blah, blah. And they, they simply misunderstand that you ask any entrepreneur what what is the number one what is the best thing about being an entrepreneur and they're going to tell you it's the freedom it's the freedom that it gives them because now they're in control of their time they're in control of their income they're in control of their of who they work with what they say yes to what they say no to right for some of them that allows them to just double down triple down and making more money for some others it allows them to say, listen, I just want to work three hours a day. I just want to work Monday to Wednesday, and that's it. And I'm going to take Thursday to Sunday off. It all depends on exactly what you want. And that is that is the purpose of entrepreneurship. It is not to make more money. Can you make more money by becoming an entrepreneur? You can, of course. But there are a lot of people who actually make less money as entrepreneurs but are happier, and they don't burn out because they're they're doing it on their terms. They're they're setting up what's important to them. They're able to spend the afternoons with their family. They're able to get home for dinner. They're able to take that vacation with their spouse. They're able to do these things that are important to them because and and it's funny I read recently that when you're in your 40s and a lot of the times we we hit this point where it's like is this is this all there is? right? Is there's all there is to it, right? I've gotten pretty good at it, but what else is out there? And a lot of the times what we what we realize is that we've been pursuing the dreams and the goals of a 17 or 18 and 19 year old us set for ourselves. And what did you know when you were 16, 17 or 18? Very little compared to what you know now. Perhaps you didn't even know your spouse. You certainly didn't have kids. You certainly didn't have the goals. So now it's also important to step back and say, hey, what do I want for the next 30 years? And that's exactly what being an entrepreneur allows you to do. If you're an employed, if you're an employee and you're an employed physician, you don't have the ease to just step back and say, hey, guess what, guys? I don't think I'm going to continue coming in on Friday because it doesn't serve my personal goals. They're going to go, well, then look for another position, yeah. right? Especially in the organization that doesn't listen to your concerns. I mean, that you compound all this stuff. It's like, if you're in a big hospital organization that like, you're saying to them, I need more support. I need more, less emphasis on productivity. I need more like flexibility to do life. And then they don't do anything about it. That just compounds all this stuff. It makes it, you're kind of like going the opposite direction of freedom and flexibility. 
And then you compound it and that's, everybody talks about burnout. And I think part of this whole healthcare crisis we have. So last year when Dr. Robert Pearl, or about two years ago, when he put out, when, when he wrote his book and, and he was going on a different podcast and we interviewed him on a podcast that I had back then called The Entrepreneur MD. And he came on and he was talking about burnout and how it is, it is a cultural thing. And it happens, it happens from residency and it happens from, for all these different levels, but there's one thing that is actually really, really curious, and it, there's almost no burnout in direct primary care or in direct to patient independent practices. It doesn't matter what level, doesn't matter what specialty, the burnout rate at those independent practices is almost non-existent when you compare it to the average population. And that tells you that, sure, it is the system, but it is also, I think, the biggest, the worst part about being an employee in a system like the current healthcare system is that they take away all of your autonomy. You are this incredibly highly trained and skilled professional who are who who's downgraded to checkbox medicine. Yep. And you're being told what to prescribe, what dosage, what diagnosis fits the criteria. You're you're you have literally your hands tied behind your back. You're just going there and you're just a highly paid trained monkey almost. And and of course that gnaws at you every day, day in, day out. You go in there, you do the same thing, same thing, same thing. Of course it's going to eat at you. So that's why I always say, listen, if we get more doctors to start opting out of the system, setting up their own practice, starting up to see their own patients where they provide a service and the pay, patient pays them, no middlemen in, in, in between. So the patient can pay a fair price and the doctor still gets compensated accordingly because what happens is that patients are getting paid, getting charged these enormous amounts mm -hmm. and doctors are getting the crumbs of it. And the mm -hmm. patients think that it's a doctor's being greedy, but in reality, what happens is that there's all these parasitic middlemen. AKA the fat. Exactly. Doing all these things. And so if we are able to start helping doctors become independent and go directly to their patients and we can educate patients to pay their doctors directly and to engage with them and then only utilize the hospital services when it is required. It's like, okay, you know what? I need open heart surgery. I need all these things. Okay. Then that's what catastrophic insurance comes in. That's where it mm -hmm. comes into play. Not for primary care, not going in for a checkup, not going in to refill my diabetes prescription, right? That's, that's part of the problem is, but doctors are terrified terrified about the idea of starting up their own practice they mm -hmm. we've been we've been indoctrinated so strongly all throughout our medical training that that we're frankly terrified yeah i love uh i love it when families that we work with decide to make the jump to direct primary care or concierge medicine mainly because of our experience with that transition has been just fantastic positive like you're saying no burnout but not only that it's like burnout is all negative but like they're happy. Like to, to me, it's like the opposite of burnout. And I interviewed some of our friends here locally. They started, it's doctors, Ryan and Katie Brown, but they started a concierge practice here in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, where I'm from. And they're just such a good example of what we're talking about. They kind of were burning out and decided to take that risk and make the jump. And it's both, it's a husband and wife physician group. So they were both employed and then started from scratch and they're young and had student loan debt. So to me, that's like the example to put up on the pedestal as like a great example of entrepreneurship and chose to do it for the right reasons and basically realize what's, you, they could pay us all the money in the world, but like, if we're gonna hate our jobs, like what's the point and made the jump and are really feeling good about it and reaping the rewards now, but it's super scary. And that's what you hit on. Also, it's very scary and intimidating and people just don't do it. I also talked recently with a physician who was a hospice doctor and doc G you may have known of him or heard of him, but he, um, talked about how one of the biggest regrets people have is not leaning into those like scary, intimidating things in life at the end of their life, they regret that, like not having taken those risks that you kind of in your heart knew you really should do, but you don't make the jump. But like, why are people so, I know there's a lot of reasons, that's a hard question, but like, why are physicians in such a challenging spot to kind of start to lean into that? Well, I think there are a lot of components, as you very well said, but a very important one are student student loans. Some of these doctors are graduating with 300000 a quarter of a million dollars of student loans. That's why 
when somebody comes over and offers them a hundred thousand dollars sign up bonus and they've been literally living like residents for the last 10 12 years of course that's incredibly you know appealing so they take it but they don't realize all the strings it comes attached to and then when they want to break free even though they're miserable about it they're like well i can't quit because i still own $200,000 $200,000 of my student loans. I've already spent the 100,000 that they gave me as a bonus. I signed a 3-year contract. So if I if I quit, I got to pay them back. So mm-hmm. now my loans are going to be 300,000. And so it's literally golden handcuffs and the system is is set up in a way that that's exactly what we're driving every physician into so that they're they're effectively locked in Mm -hmm. to a system that that is just bent on exploiting them it's just cheap not cheap but it's just almost slavery i'd like to say and and the reason is because we don't we don't see these options we are not trained to consider these alternatives we were talking before we started recording about some of these non-clinical career facebook groups and things like that and the first step is like a doctor comes in there and says like i love I love seeing my patients, but I can't deal with the system. So I'm willing to give up and I just want to get a job in pharma. I want to get a job at insurance. I want to get a desk job. Like if what you want to do is see patients, why haven't you thought about opening up your own practice? And especially, you know, when you're talking about an internal medicine doctor, a pediatrician, something like that, that is not even like interventional is you could set up your office anywhere and start seeing patients, but they simply don't conceive of that idea, or they think that it is way too risky, or the other big problem is that people don't really start considering their options until they've had it with their job. They're like, I absolutely hate my job. I wish I was in a car accident so I didn't have to go to work for like two weeks. And at that point is that when they're saying, I cannot go in there anymore. And mm-hmm. of course, they they also look on the other side and say, but I got $30,000 a month of living expenses or $20,000 a month of, of living expenses. I cannot just start a business. So I need a job tomorrow that is going to provide for those things. That's why I always mm-hmm. say, let's start with a side gig, right? Yeah. Let's start. And, and I help a lot of doctors do that. Help them yeah. understand you can grab your own expertise and start creating online a following and start creating some additional site revenue that is still related to your field mm-hmm. that can start helping you offset that risk. Mm-hmm. And suddenly when you're making an extra $3,000 a month, then that doesn't that starts giving you options. Now you can start negotiating your, your contract and you say, if I'm making $3,000 a month in this side, working four hours a week, maybe if I raise it, I could make more. So now they don't have that much leverage on me here, right? Mm-hmm. And then eventually you you take the plunge. Yeah, I think that's a good path to consider. I think the pushback that comes to mind, if I'm thinking critically on that, I'm like, does that really like address? I feel like there's this underlying issue that we all kind of deal with of like fear and greed and money. It's like money is driving our decision making, unfortunately, and it's hard to get away from that. So the student loans, obviously, that's kind of like fearful. And then there's also on the flip side, like this, I I guess you could call it greed, but like this intense desire to become rich and wealthy and financially independent and all that stuff. And those two things, and then just money in general tend to like really lock people down and make it really hard to make decisions. But then when you look at people that are late stage life, and most people that have really thought about this, will con- agree that money doesn't translate to happiness. And in some cases it's the reverse, but yet we're like so attached to this thing of like money equals number one on my list always. And that like paralyzes us in some cases from making the shift, or at least it's a pretty steep hurdle and it causes people to kind of take baby steps. I think where I was talking with the doc- Dr. Browns earlier or referring to that earlier, I think where they like had this shift is they took money out of the equation. Not everybody can do that, but like, I think that's a home run if you can do that, because then it's like, what are you, if, if money is not in the equation anymore, you're going to, you're going to kind of take that off this like motivational cycle. Then it's like, well, why are we doing it? And then you can really start to say like, what is my purpose in life? Like what's most important to me? And like, why should I be making decisions instead of just being like, I have to pay off these student loans. I'm stuck in this job. Well, you're not really stuck in the job. Like you don't have to. I mean, student loans these days too are like in the United States are tied to your income. So like really they're ultra flexible 
in that you, if you're making no income, you're not making a payment. It's not that huge of a deal. And I think student loans kind of get painted as this huge, scary thing and people kind of get really fearful and paralyzed from it. But I think it's really important to kind of explore that fear and greed. And I think, like I said, the, the baby steps is one way to do it. Everybody's different too. I had my own kind of shift in my career where I got fed up with like the corporate world and I did the whole 180 degree thing. Like in a, once I realized it was like not worth the money, I'm like 180 degrees shift over three months. Like I had to move quick, but most people are not like that. And it, it, there's different ways to kind of go that path for you. Was it, how was it? You were never really in this like corporate machine, were you? No, I was never employed. So my very first job while I was still doing some of the trainings, my very first job was doing Botox and fillers treatments on cruise ships. So I was a contractor. I just had to show up. I wouldn't get paid if I didn't sell. So that also helped me a lot. I learned how to sell. And I tell people I was selling $20,000 worth of Botox every week. So that was really good. That was a good experience. But that was the closest I got to being an employee. However, I understand the risk that a lot of people have. And there are two things. One is obviously the money, like you said, right? We have that 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 fear, like where, where is my paycheck going to come from? What if I don't make enough money? What if all these things? And of course, we've got the, the loans. The other important thing is a lot of the times when doctors start working and you, know, you become an attending and you get these bonuses and you do all these other things, it's like we all race our, 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 our expenses. Right. We're still not paying our loans, but a lot of the times we will raise our expenses. And so suddenly what we realize is that now I'm spending this much money. I cannot go back to making the amount of money that I was making as a as as an attending. So of course that adds to that risk. But the exercise that I always work with a lot of my clients on is I ask them and I said, listen. Let's start figuring this out because it's, it's funny. I call it the fractional CMO because that's easy to comprehend and to explain. But in reality, there's a lot more coaching that goes into place because, of course, we help our clients or big clients set up their, their marketing, their businesses, their systems, all of those things and execute upon them. But all of those things are worthless if they hate their job, if they hate their life. The reason why we do what we do, the only reason why we work, all of us, is so that we can fuel our lives, whatever that looks like, whatever we like to do, whatever we enjoy doing. Nobody wakes up and says like, oh my God, I wish I could just come to work every day for the rest of my life. We say, I go to work and I enjoy it and I like it, but the only reason I do it is so that I can be fueling my life. I can be you know, spending more time with my family, I can be traveling, I can be doing all these things. So I help them realize a lot of that. And I help them understand like, listen, before we go in there, a lot of the times I say, do you really want to grow your practice in that manner? Do you really want to see twice as many patients in a year? Do you really want to be, you know, have a second or a third or a fourth location? Because do you understand what that's going to do to your lifestyle? So I help them recognize first, it's like, what is the lifestyle that you want to build? And instead of building a big business where you're getting X amount of money, arbitrary numbers that we often come up with, we say like, oh, if I was just making a million a year, if I was just making 500,000 a year, these are arbitrary numbers that we have no idea how we got to them. But we say, listen, what is it that you would like to achieve? Instead of saying, I want to get to that point and then I'm going to make my life fit around my business. Why don't you just decide what is the life you want to live? And then you build a practice that lives around or that serves that vision. And when we do that, oftentimes all of these things that you just mentioned come up. Oh, but I need to pay for this. I need to do these things. And I, I wish I could do that, but I can't. And I say, okay, imagine for a second what would you do if you were not scared? What would you do if you had no fear of failure? If you knew that it was going to work? If, you, if the number that you come up with is you need to make $233,000 in a year, and it doesn't matter which path you choose, I can assure you that you're going to end the year with $233,000 in, you know, in your income report, what would you do? How would you like to get that? The only condition is that you actually have to do something for it, right? You cannot just say, well, I would be sitting at the beach sipping margaritas. It's like, 
you have to do something for it. It doesn't matter what it is. It's going to work. You're going to end up with 233,000. What would you choose? Most of the time, most of the time, they come up with a different, with a business that looks a lot different to what they're currently pursuing every day. And what we realize is that a lot of the time, we are working a business with some dream, abstract goal of, I'm going to continue doing this until I get to X point so that I can do this other thing, so that I can pivot to this other thing. But because this is abstract, we never get there. So we just we just tire. We just get exhausted of it. We just get disappointed because we're not feeling or getting any closer. And we realize my kids are getting older. I'm not spending as much time as I want with them. I'm not filling my bank account as high as I wanted to. I'm not doing all these other things. So no wonder we start getting disappointed and frustrated. And we say, we know that we don't want what we are having, but we don't know what we do want. I think the whole side gig and like we were talking about earlier and the whole passive income focus and then the fire movement, all of those things are big things in the physician circles. And I think they're compounding the problem in some ways because they're just stretching you even thinner and over committing you because you already got the it's almost like those are all extra things you're putting on top of your already challenging job it's not i guess it's not really addressing the root issue underlying issue and i think like you hit it the underlying issue is that you are not happy in fact maybe you hate your job it's a strong word but i've heard it a bunch of times is that there's this really and it's the classic I mean, I've heard it many times said is like, I enjoy working with patients, but I hate my job. And that's always a clear sign that like, there's some issues going on. But like the cool thing about entrepreneurship is you can create whatever you want. I mean, it's, it's a blank sheet of paper. You kind of start from scratch and you can say, okay, that's the thing that I think is missing too. In the physician circles, it's starting to gain some traction, but it's like all these problems we're talking about. If you're an entrepreneur, that's like opportunity flips to opportunities because all the problems means you can solve them and people are doing a bad job solving them. And that means you're a huge competitive advantage. And that's what I see with these direct primary care concierge practices is they're fearful, fearful at first, but like when they get going, start the business and it's got this unique differentiator, people flock to it because they're like, man, this is unique. I mean, we've been look because patients are not ignorant to all this stuff like they get it. I say this to doctors all the time. I ran a very successful clinic in Cancun fueled by 95% American patients. The other 5% came from Europe. Nobody was, was from Mexico. And, and the reason I tell them this is not because we were turning them off. It's just that our practice was ridiculously busy with patients from the US. And it was cash only. Prices started at $16,000 per treatment. And the reason we were able to do that, or the reason that that worked is because there is more than enough people tired of being treated poorly, not just clinically, but as people, they're tired of being treated that way. And they're happy to pay for adequate service. And that's what I tell them, like, listen, you don't need all 300 million Americans to agree that they will pay for medical care out of pocket. You just need 500 in your state who are willing to say, you know what? Yeah, this is worth it. This is worth my time. This is worth my investment because I get to pay my doctor directly. I get to the service and you as a doctor, now you get to sit with your patients. You get to spend the time that they deserve, that they require. It's not just because you're a good person. It's because in order to provide the adequate service, you need to learn a lot more stuff than you're able to with a three minute visit. And so it just becomes more enjoyable for everyone. Patients are happy to pay for that. That's, that's a big fear that a lot of doctors will have, especially pediatricians and, and family docs and anything that could be considered primary care. They're like, who's going to want to pay for this? I already have all these, all these people coming in and complaining about the copays. Like, no, the thing is, you're not going to start your own practice and try to get those same people to come to your practice. You're going to find people who are willing to come to this new kind of doctor that you're becoming. And the more people who do that, the more the tides shift. But instead, what we're doing is we're just perpetuating the bad cycle. Like, well, we just have bad medical care because we have bad insurance because patients don't want to pay for it and the patients don't value it. It's like, well, let's let's flip it around. Let's find a few who will value it, who are happy mm -hmm. to pay for it. Yep.
In my industry, I'm, as I was saying before, I'm a financial planner for physicians by day. And so in our industry, it's so similar in a lot of ways. Like our industry traditionally, and the majority is very, very product focused and like sell products to make a living and manage investments. Basically like the clients don't pay us directly and we make money from these other things that are behind the scenes. And it's similar to healthcare in that like the insurance company, the patients don't pay the physicians directly. It's all this stuff that happens. It's confusing and complicated behind the scenes. But that's what my shift was. Is I realized like I don't sleep very well at night because it causes these unfair incentives and conflicts of interest. And like you don't focus in the right areas and you end up doing quick visits and having a million clients. And so when I shifted, it was just like, all right, it's going to be, let's simplify this thing. You pay us, we work with you. Simple, plain Jane, like advice, like a concierge practice. And what happened is, and then the, what the shift that I didn't expect exactly, cause I was, I guess, overconfident in the old job. I didn't realize how much our shift would be towards like what the true value was with the clients. And I think the same thing is true in medicine is like, we now became incentivized to like really add value kind of like holistically or comprehensively, like across a broad scope of like whatever their issues were. And instead of just like these products that we were kind of incentivized to sell. And I think, so when you create a business that kind of aligns incentives and simplifies things, it's like difficult to see that until you get into it, but like it completely aligns you much more with the end user or the patient or the, the client or whatever. And that you can come up with these things you never even really thought of beforehand, but I can tell you it solves a lot of these issues with like these middlemen and third parties that are just crushing it. And, and we're already doing it elsewhere, right? We're already going to the farmer's market so that we can buy directly from the producer. We're going to the butchers so that we know what we're getting there. We're, we're doing all these things already. It's not such a difficult shift, and it's not a big ask for patience. So that's one of the things that I always like to emphasize to people who are considering this. Now, it's also not for everyone. Sometimes people might say like, no, you know what? I just want to show up, get paid to do my job, and then leave. Like, okay, great. If that's working out for you, that's great. But if, if you're in the system and you're unhappy, don't wait until you're absolutely terrified of going back to work to start doing something different and start investing in yourself. Start investing. And when I say investing in yourself, I mean, start developing some skills, start setting aside some time and building an audience, right? People think that building an audience online is all about just doing TikToks and, and Instagrams. You don't have to do that. Like you just told me that you've been following a lot of the stuff that I've been putting out. I, I don't do TikToks. I don't do Instagrams. I write <laughs> a daily blog post. That's what I do. That's yeah. my thing. I write one blog post every day and, and I have a weekly newsletter and that's pretty much it, right? And so that's what you can start doing because that's the other mistake. We don't need a gigantic audience. We just need a handful of people who really value, respect what we're doing. And then opportunities are going to start opening up. And that's the most important thing. When you start building these opportunities for you, now you're no longer locked in to these different situations. Now you have options. Like I said at the beginning, now if you don't like the hours that you were given for the next quarter, you can negotiate that. Now, if you don't like the conditions of your contract, you don't have to renew it because you have options. Now you have leverage. Before that, they know that, well, they're going to take whatever we give them. And that's why we see reimbursements getting cut. That's why we see Medicare payments getting cut. That's why we see shifts extended. That's why we see all these things because doctors have no leverage. So build your own leverage. Don't wait for somebody else to come and, and, and change the situation. We'll say like, well, you know, we need to get some politicians out there. We also need to start lobbying and the AMA needs to do these things. And why don't you start betting on yourself? Get yourself out of the problem. And then maybe if you want to help, you can do it from the outside. But first, take care of yourself, right? Look after yourself because that's that's what matters to you, or at least it should be what matters to you so that you can spend more time with your kids, so that you can do the things that matter to you instead of sitting back and waiting for things to change because it is so unfair how they treat us. Yeah, it is. It sucks. It shouldn't be that way. But you've got a lot more control than you think. Yeah, focus on the solutions. And I think social media is one that seems like it's been slow to catch on in the physician circles, at least when I, so I started my business in 2014 and it was like, we were going to work with physicians and I got on social media and I was like, nobody's here. <laughs> 
there was very, very few physicians on social media, but then like fast forward to today, there's a, there's a ton more. And the other thing about social media too, is you start to see like stories of people doing things like what we're talking about, like the right way. And like, they're happy and they're kind of focusing on solutions and coming together. And that's, that will reinforce, you have to be careful with social media too. I've been through the social media rabbit hole myself. Like you gotta, right. you don't want to end up on like, like you said, but TikTok, but like on your Facebook feed, like right, watching right. cat videos or whatever. I mean, I think we all know that, but investing in yourself. That's a little bit of common sense. I think that what's important is investing in yourself. And if you don't want to do social media, don't do social media. There are other ways. You can do speaking engagements. You can do paid speaking. You can do radio interviews. You can do podcasts. You can do all these things that are open to us and where people will value your expertise. But the problem is that as doctors, we sit back and we wait for somebody else to choose us and you have to choose yourself first. You have to say, listen, this is what I want to do because it's what's most important to me. We have to be a little bit selfish here. And we need to say, what is the life that I want to build? What is the legacy that I want to leave? What do I want my kids to say during my eulogy? They're not going to remember the hours that I put in the hospital. They're not going to remember all the injustices that I put up with just so that I could put my food on the table. They're going to remember the times that we spent together. They're going to remember about the vacation that we were able to take. And it doesn't even have to be fancy or, or, or expensive or anything like that. It just has to be time, quality time with them. So figure out what's most important to you and start looking and taking the steps to make that a reality. As we said at the beginning, when we first came to Spain, that was almost four years ago, it was to be closer to my in-laws so that they could see the kids and whatnot. Why have we stayed? Because it works for my lifestyle. Now I'm time shifted. I can see patients. I can take it easy in the morning, right? Me time, go out, work out, do all those things. And in the afternoons, I get to work because my clients are waking up. It works for me. It might not work for you. And that's the beauty of lifestyle design. Yeah. And I think it goes against like your, maybe your past experiences and your training to be totally uh, like you said a little bit selfish but it's not i guess you know you could call it self-care and it's interesting to me that the physician career track is like heavy invest in self because in uh, medical school it's like massive self-investment right. and then it's like you get out of training and then it's like <laughs> the floodgates close it's like no more invest in self <laughs> actually you know you continue investing in yourself but here's the thing it's actually framed as an investment in your patients mm. so for 15 years and even more once you're practicing, you're investing in your patients. You're not investing in yourself. There are no self-help. You know, at least I didn't get any like self-help seminars. I didn't get anything talking to me about productivity, talking about time management, talking about spirituality, any of these things that are important for personal growth, even finance. I didn't get any of that. All of my investment was geared towards serving my patients better because we're indoctrinated with the idea that the better you are, the better you get as a doctor, the more successful you'll be, the more patients you'll have, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, it doesn't correlate. That's why we see all these incredibly talented and gifted physicians barely making ends meet. And then we see these other doctors who are not nearly as talented, but who are doing very, very, very well because they understand the game they're playing. A lot of times we don't understand the game we're playing because we don't take a step back and figure out, is this a game I want to play? Because we have options. We don't have to live with the default settings. Yeah. So investing in yourself, I think is, is really good. I mean, as we're recording this, it's early in the year. So it's like, New Year's resolution time. And a lot of people, hopefully you're not the majority of people that are going to set those New Year's, New Year's resolutions and then they're going to kind of fall away like we've all had experience of doing. Hopefully they're going to stick. I think investing in yourself is such a, a good one because the fruits of that labor are going to be kind of lifelong and it's, but it's, I think it's so difficult to start these things. I think that's in a lot of cases that first step is the hardest. And then once you get the first step, it's difficult to keep taking the steps. I mean, you know, you got to take 21 steps or whatever they say for the habit to be formed to, to kind of get, get the thing going. But like when you're stuck in this like fearful environment and say you're, you know, in practice and you got dead and you got family and you, you hate your job, maybe you're not admitting that yet, but like you're just frustrated and everything we've said makes sense, but you're like, I don't know where to go with this. Where like I get, like what is just like a baby step. I mean, I talked about like the all in approach and I'm, uh, that's how I roll sometimes, but that's, that's not 
not always responsible <laughs> I know, I know, either. <laughs> I, I feel, yeah, I do the same thing. But it gets to a point where it's no longer responsible, or especially if, if your family's income is reliant on you. Yes. So the very first step is to take that step back and realize, is this a job, a role, a life that I want to continue living? What's going to happen if I do the exact same thing that I'm doing today, if I do that for the rest of the year? Where am I going to be in January 1st, 2024, Mm -hmm. if I don't change anything right now? And if you're happy with what you imagine was was going to be take place January 1st, 2024, if you don't change anything, then that's great. You're on a great path. Don't change anything. But if you realize that, you know what, this is not something that I want to continue doing. A lot of times we just continue going because we're on autopilot like well you know i'll just see where the chips fall like no dude it's actually unless it's getting better it's getting worse so Mm. the first step is to take a step back and realize is this what i want to continue doing is this going to be good enough for me that if i don't change anything january 2024 i'm going to be happy and if the answer is no then you need to take a step back and say okay great what are the things or thing that i want to stop doing what is the one thing that if i stopped doing the rest of the year would be better. And what is the one thing that if I started doing, the rest of the year would be better. And just make it very, very, very small. And here's the kicker. The following day, don't think about the thing you want to do it. Think about why you're doing it. If you decide that, you know what, I hate this because I'm not seeing my family. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing blah, 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 all these different things that you know you want to do. That's when it comes into play. Like, I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this because I want to live with my kids. Like for me, it is my kids realizing that My kids were growing up and I was not there for the important things and that my oldest son was never going to be five months again, was not going to have his first swimming lesson again, and I had missed it, was not going to do all these other things that I wanted to be there for them. That's what makes me recognize that, okay, this is what I want to do. Right. And it's the same thing. It's the same with whatever you want to do once once you understand those things and then figure out there's seven and a half billion people in the planet right now. There's been several more billion who have lived in this planet, somebody has <laughs> probably already done what you want to do. Read about them. Look into what they're doing. Ask questions. My posts last year were seen by more than 2 million people on LinkedIn, right? How many people do you think reached out to me and asked me a question? <laughs> Five or six? No, not very many. Less than 20. Yeah. Less than 20. And and it's clearly there in my profile. DMs always open. Less than 20 people reached out and say, listen, Man. that is interesting. Be careful what you ask for. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, Dr. E is up for questions. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You just follow me I on mean, LinkedIn. Get, first of all, get a LinkedIn profile too. Like mm-hmm. a lot of you listening probably don't. LinkedIn is my favorite social media for professional growth at least, and um, connecting, and you can find people like you doing it the right way. And you can ask a question and you're like, I'm struggling with this, because at the end of the day, it's all very personal to your situation and everybody varies. And a lot of times it's a simple solution. It's like, and a third, you know, another person throwing a little nugget at you will really turn the corner. It's like, hey, check out this book. Like, that's a simple, easy. I saw that you, you, you quoted some Jim Rohn stuff. That's like one of my favorite suggestions for like, business philosophy challenges. And I've been telling people for the last year since I discovered it, you go to Audible, you get a free account. And for one credit, which is $15, or actually you can, you can claim that as your free book. They have the entirety of Jim Rohn seminars as a single product. Mm. It's 14 hours of Jim Rohn and you can get it for free on Audible. <laughs> And yeah. people don't get it. That alone, that little tiny thing, that's good for if you're like, not sh- you don't have your mindset right and you don't have business philosophy like i'm saying like career and you know how things work and how you can progress and entrepreneurship and all those things i think that's fantastic for like foundational knowledge and motivation if that's your thing that you need to work on but like everybody's so different and so you might be like i gotta practice i'm like doing the entrepreneurship thing and now i've got everything kicking it's going it's hitting but i've gotten so much success that i'm like i got too many things going on and like now I got it. it. That's a different flavor of like challenge. And, you know, I'm not going to suggest necessarily Jim run in that situation. It's like more of like a, how to learn to say no, maybe, uh, or boundaries or something like that. You get, you get different challenges at different levels. That's another thing. And it's really good that you pointed it out when people do reach out or they do look for, for, for help. And that's something that I always tell them, like, listen, 
don't go out there and not because it's not valuable. It's incredibly valuable, right? For instance, you hear the interviews with Richard Branson about how he's running his 16 companies. Like you're just thinking about starting your very first company. Don't, don't expect to set all those things in, in, in motion and get all these different people and assistants and teams and it happen because that's going to sound overwhelming. Instead, go look for somebody who's done what you're doing. If, if you're miserable at your job, Connect with a couple of other doctors on LinkedIn who you see that they left their job in the last year and they started their own primary practice. Hey, how's it going for you? Mm -hmm. Are you hating it? Do you regret it? <laughs> what do yeah. you wish you knew? I can assure you 90% of them are going to re respond because one thing I've found out with most doctors who go into direct primary care or direct care, they can't stop talking about it. Correct. <laughs> They just can't because it's like breaking free from the matrix. Like, Correct. oh, my God, I cannot believe I put up with that for so long. So listen to them. And you might decide not to do it. That's fine. But at least start taking those steps because that's taking a step. People think that taking a step is starting a business. No, taking a step is talking to people who've done it. Yeah. And asking and, for help, having the courage. That takes a little courage or putting oh, totally. your neck out. It's like asking for help. In itself is we're really bad at that doctors and saying hey i don't have all the answers that's that's a tough one we don't cover that in med school <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then, i mean sometimes it's like everybody's got different challenges too so like you know maybe your like childhood and there's some like sometimes therapy is like the best thing to go kind of unpack some of these like if you're stuck really i think sometimes like therapy or even coaching depending on where your issues are can kind of help break you free but like i love i love what you suggested as far as like connecting with people and then just asking for help. It's so interesting that so few people are asking those questions, which just kind of a shows what's what's going on. Even, even people who have signed up for my newsletter and they get my emails every week and all they need to do is hit reply on one of those. Like, hey, I like this article. What about this? Or have you tried this? Or what? You would think, I, I, I seriously second guessed using my actual email to send out that newsletter. <laughs> and then when I asked the, the person that is that is coaching me on this, he said, ah, just do it. Nobody's going to reply to it. And I figured, <laughs> of course, what, what do you mean? I'm sending it out to 600 people already. It was like, just do it. And sure mm -hmm. enough, nobody replies to him. Yeah. I mean, we say the same thing all the time. I'm like, ask questions. This is a, like we do a, a finance for physicians podcast, like bring the questions and they're few and far between. And there's this right. intimidation, I think, or fear of judgment and we're not going to judge you. I mean, but like, I know that there's that fear and you kind of have to work through all those things. Right. But I mean, the first step is just to try it. I promise it's not going to be as bad and give it one attempt, ask right. one person for help and credible. So from my point of view, the very first step is to recognize that you don't want to stay on this path for the rest of the year. You don't even have to think 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Just think, do I want to stay on this path for the rest of the year? How happy or how disappointed am I going to be at the end of 2023 if I haven't changed my current situation? Once you do that, if you're honest with yourself, now it's like, okay, perfect. What am I going to do today? Just a little thing. You don't need to, like you said, you don't need to start a business right away because I have some of those people are like, yeah, I decided and I just incorporated an LLC, opened up a bank account. It's like, you don't have to do that just yet, but realize that you're not happy. You cannot continue kidding yourself the moment that you put that out there into the light. I'm not happy with the path that I'm taking. So I'm going to start taking steps to change that. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is like, just start reaching out to people. Hey, how do you do this? What do you wish you, you knew before? What books did you read? What podcasts did you listen to? What interviews caught your attention? What magazines are interested? And, and start learning, figuring it out. And there's probably going to be somebody out there who can help you get started. Yeah. Or at least inspire you. That's also very important. You need somebody who inspires you. You need to see somebody else who was in a similar situation to you who achieved what you want to achieve. That's super important. They're like, you're like, if, he, if Dr. E can do it, I can totally do it. <laughs> That's what I tell people. Like most of the doctors that I work with have a lot more training than I did as a clinician. Like, listen, you know, I wasn't particularly bright. So it's not that it requires brightness, it just requires self-awareness and saying, this is not the path that I want. This is the one that I want. And, and letting go of certain arbitrary goals 
and identities that we've that we've given to ourselves. Like, no, 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 well, this is the thing. And I need to have the job at Mayo Clinic and blah, blah, blah. I need to have the job at here. I need to, like, mm-hmm. that's not who you are. At right. the end of the day, nobody's going to care about that. Your kids are not going to care about you having a job at X or Y. They're going to care about where you're Nobody there ever for puts them. that on, like, their eulogy, like you were saying, like, nobody, that's not. Nobody. I mean, or your maybe credentials. It's somewhere, but like, nobody cares, actually. MD, PhD, blah, blah, blah. Like, nobody cares. Yeah. I, I love going back to Jim Rohn. There's so many applications. His definition of success. I think he says like a few small disciplines or steps repeated daily over a lifetime. Right. I think it's something right. along those lines. But basically it's like one step. And then I think his definition of failure is the reverse of that. Is it like a few missteps yeah. done daily yeah, over a lifetime? Half, half a dozen things repeated it often enough and you can be successful. The thing is what's easy to do, it's easy not to do. Yeah, inaction is the is really <laughs> kind of categorized as a, as a, right. a mistake or a failure mm-hmm. in, in, in a lot of cases. Awesome. Well, exactly. as we wrap up, I wanted to kind of circle back to what you're doing and where people can find you because you've thrown out this idea of questions. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, what are you up to? Where can people find you? So I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. And uh, since Freedom of Speech came back to Twitter, I've also been very active there at Dr. Ernesto MD. So both of those social platforms and same thing, DrErnestoMD.com. That's my website. Like I said, I write an, an essay every day. They're what we call, most of them are what we call atomic essays, which are less than 700 words. You can usually read them in two to three minutes. And you can sign up for the newsletter there where I, I send one actionable business tip every week. That's just there as well, DrErnestoMD.com. And if you do DrErnestoMD.com forward slash quiz, if you are already a practicing, uh, an independent practicing physician, or you have your own healthcare business, that's a 15 question quiz that will help you realize how well you're marketing. And it'll give you the answers to turn it around if you're not doing it great enough. Mm-hmm. Because that that's is completely a- free. You don't need and- an opt in. You don't need to, to leave your email. Just go to drnsmd.com forward slash quiz and take the quiz. And that'll give you a score. And then what you need to do is you just grab all the questions that you replied no to, and you work on making them yeses for the rest of the year, and you're good to go. Yeah, that's a commonly overlooked area of medical practices and probably all businesses, but it seems like medical practices, marketing is, there's no plan or there's not, or maybe it's halfway done, or it's like 10 years old or whatever. So there's lots of opportunity and, and marketing is like the gasoline. I mean, that drives the shit. Totally. That's what I was telling them. Like, listen, you can be the best doctor in the world, but if patients can't find you, it's your training is worthless. Literally. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, this has been fun. I've enjoyed it. And thank you for coming on. Yeah, you bet. Thank you so much for having me. Had a great time. 